everyone, um, welcome to the second uh, of our seminar series for the Robotics Center. Um, today's guest is Jack Langlin. He is an associate professor in aerospace engineering from Penn State. Um, his work is in sorry, um, state estimation, data fusion, path planning, control for UAVs. Um, he received his PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford, some mm -hmm. version of that. Um, and I'll let him talk about uh, teaching drones how to soar. All right, thanks, Mima. Um, Okay, so we're going to be talking about drones and about soaring flight. Uh, soaring, broadly speaking, is the idea of extracting energy from the atmosphere. Okay? Uh, and there's a, a few different ways to do that. Uh, and we'll kind of get into some details and narrow the problem down a little bit. The first question is, uh, uh, why bother teaching a drone to soar? Uh, my research focuses on drones that, that I call small. And small drones means things that are about this big. Okay, this is how big the drones are. Uh, and they have a mass of order two, three kilograms, uh, give or take. Um, and, and you find yourself in a hole in two different ways uh, when you're talking about drones that size. The first is because you're small, you don't have a whole lot of room on board for, uh, for energy, right? So if you're a fuel-powered vehicle, not a whole lot of room for, for gasoline or, or nitro. Um, and if you're a battery-powered airplane, there's not a whole lot of room for battery on board the aircraft. Uh, the other way that you get hit is because you're small, you're probably not flying all that fast, and your Reynolds numbers are fairly low. Uh, Reynolds numbers of order 200,000 for small drones. If you're a sailplane that's carrying a human being, then your Reynolds number are, are of order 2 million. Uh, and that means that viscous forces become pretty important for you, more so than they are with a full-scale airplane. Uh, which means that aerodynamically your, your vehicle is not nearly as efficient as a vehicle that proportionally might look fairly similar to a full-size sailplane would look, right? You can go and buy for yourself a competition sailplane that has an L over D of, of 50 or 60 or so, uh, a really, really good radio-controlled airplane with a wingspan about like this has an L over D of about 20. Okay? So there's immediately a factor of two and a half that shows up in there in aerodynamic efficiency. And so the idea is, is by harvesting energy from the atmosphere, you can overcome some of those uh, physical limitations of the vehicle. And as you'd expect, right, birds, which happen to live in, in really the same flight regime as these drones do, have developed over several million years all kinds of flight techniques to harvest energy from the atmosphere. Right? So one example is the albatross. Um, they do something called dynamic soaring. Lord Rayleigh first described this in 1885 or so. Uh, and what they're doing is extracting energy from the fact there's wind shear. Right? For, so that they, they're harvesting energy from the fact that, that uh, the speed of the wind changes with altitude close to the surface of the ocean. And they can glide for thousands of kilometers without ever flapping their wings. Okay. So a really cool thing for, for an albatross to be able to do. They can flap, okay? Yeah, they can eat, right? Yeah, yeah, they, they can eat, right? Uh, well, we could put a battery on board, right? Which is internal engine. If I recharge the battery, then, you know, so. Um, right, but, but you wouldn't have an albatross fly 1,000 kilometers with just flapping their wings, right? That they, they can actually lock their wing joints. Yeah, but when they're doing dynamic soaring, their wings aren't flapping. Okay? So their, their wing joints are locked in that case. Um, uh, everyone has seen eagles of various kinds and hawks go soaring, right? They, they circle in, in rising air. They go and find regions uh, along ridges where the wind is blowing up the ridge. Uh, they can fly down the ridge again, right? They can fly for several hundred kilometers without, without ever flapping their wings. Or they can step for hours without ever flapping their wings. Vultures do the same thing. Uh, vultures operate slightly differently than eagles do. Their wing loading is a little bit lower. Uh, they tend to fly a little bit slower. Um, and, and kind of their mission is a bit different than, than a typical migrating eagle. Um, this is a, a, a seagull. Seagulls will go soaring all over the place. Uh, seagulls will even be able to soar over open ocean. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, there was a researcher, Woodcock, out over the ocean near, near Barbados, uh, and he was looking at thermal soaring behavior of seagulls, and, and there's a definite relationship between the, the temperature difference between the water and the air and between the amount of wind that is blowing. Okay? You need a certain temperature difference between water and air. You have to have warm water and cool air to get convection happening. You also need a certain amount of wind speed to add just enough of a kind of instability to kick off convection from happening. Okay? Uh, and so when those two things combine, then you see uh, a thermal soaring behavior by flocks of seagulls. In, in one of his papers, he even has an anecdotal story 
uh, where a huge flock of seagulls were just sitting on the ocean. All of a sudden, they all took off, started flying around and flap flying in a circle. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they all stopped flapping and started soaring and gaining altitude. Uh, and then he's had a couple of speculations on, on what it was they were trying to do, right? One of the speculations was that they, they were, as a flock, trying to trigger the instability that would cause a thermal to kick off. All right, the other possibility is that they kind of could feel the, the really light winds starting to kick off the thermal themselves, and they took off in time to, to take advantage of that. This is a frigate bird. A uh, frigate bird will also go soaring over open ocean. Uh, the interesting thing about a frigate bird is that its feathers are not waterproof. It doesn't have webbed feet. If it hits the water, it will die. Uh, and yet, frigate birds will go and do soaring flights of a couple of hundred kilometers out over open ocean. Um, the plot that I've just, just pulled up right, shows altitude as a function of time for one of these soaring frigate birds. Uh, this bird managed to soar up to an altitude of 2,500 meters. Um, and he's got a couple of soaring uh, kind of periods up to 1,500, 2,000 meters even at nighttime, right? So over open ocean, you even find convection at night, which normally over land we don't find. Uh, pelicans will go soaring. Uh, you'll see thermal soaring pelicans in uh, Nevada, uh, and you'll see pelicans doing this near beaches pretty regularly. Uh, these pelicans actually look like they're doing what's called ridge soaring or orographic soaring, right? So it's an offshore wind kicking up off the, uh, the, the wave, right? And so there's an upward component of, of wind as it follows the slope of the wave up, and they're soaring in that upward component of air. And so the question is, how do we get this stuff to work for humans, right? And, and it turns out that humans have been trying to soar for almost as long as we've been trying to fly. Um, so this is Otto Lilienthal. Uh, he is arguably the first person to successfully fly. Um, here he is, he's gliding down, uh, down a hill, um, and, and he's not soaring here, right? All of his flights ended up lower than where he started, so he's technically gliding. Uh, he is arguably the first person to series produce an aircraft. He made nine copies of this, and in 1896, he crashed this model of airplane and he died. So who was the first to really soar? Well, it turns out, right, in addition to the other things they managed to figure out first, it looks like the Wright brothers were the first to actively go and try and go do soaring. Right? In, in 1908, 1909, they went back to Kitty Hawk with a glider with the express intention of trying to figure out how to go ridge soaring over the sand dunes by Kitty Hawk. And then uh, here's a photo of, of, of them doing this. Right? So, so here what's going on is the Wright brothers are intentionally trying to go and do soaring flight. And then they're really just doing it for, for fun. Right? They've seen the birds do that the whole time they were down at Kitty Hawk getting their flying figured out. Not exactly. They understood that the key to Yeah, but the, I mean, we knew their control system worked already in 1902, right? When they, when they were gliding, their 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 you know their early gliders. But they very very much talked about the need to practice, and uh, and they had kept track of how many flying hours they had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and birds and bats have all those little sensors, all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you're pinned down from what you know from. Okay, so you may fly for a while, and then what? Yeah. So I'll we'll get to that actually. So the, the, the sensing I have on, on my aircraft doesn't have any of that stuff, right? We have the, the standard stuff you can buy with any old off-the-shelf autopilot that's living on my airplanes. Okay? So we'll, we'll see how all that stuff works. So uh, this is Peter Mazak flying in a scimitar uh, near Lock Haven in Pennsylvania. He's ridge soaring. Okay? So uh, this happens regularly in the Appalachian Mountains. Wind's blowing up the side of the hill, uh, and, and he can fly along the mountains. For a long time, all of the major distance records for, for soaring flight were being set along the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, and, and it's not until uh, you know, somewhat more recently, I think 2003 was this flight, uh, 3,000 kilometers is the, is, is the current distance record for soaring that was done in wave along the Andes. Um, so this is wave. Uh, this is a gravity wave that gets triggered uh, downstream of a large mountain range. This particular photo, I found on the internet, it's not me, uh, taken from 24,000 feet above the Livingston Range in Alberta. Uh, the current altitude record is 52,000 feet set by the Perland Project a few months ago. Um, and before that, you know, the, one of the, the early wave altitude records was, uh, uh, was 45,000 feet in a wave off the Sierra Nevadas.
And so wave is a way that you can get to, to huge altitudes. Um, I'm sorry, is there a way to tell that there's a wave in that picture? Uh, in this, well, so you're really, really high in this case, uh, and thermals don't typically go to 24,000 feet. Uh, maybe you could find you know, near the equator, uh, you know, a towering Q or a cumulonimbus cloud and get yourself up that high, although that'd be a little dangerous. Um, other clues, so you can see the leading edge of the cloud just downstream here, and I don't see any lenticular clouds in this particular photo, but that would otherwise be the key, right? So the, the kind of lens-shaped clouds that you see over the mountain range. In this case, I, I, I don't see those clouds. Okay, so autonomous soaring. In, in 2005, um, uh, Mike Allen down at NASA of uh, Dryden uh, started to fly this aircraft. Uh, there's an SBXC. You can buy one off the shelf. It's got a 14-foot wingspan. Um, and he put an autopilot on board, uh, and he managed to, you know, by, after flying in, in kind of a you know, racetrack kind of a pattern, when he detects that he's in a thermal, which you can do by, by measuring your, your climb rates, right? then he banks the airplane to a circle and climbs and, and, and was uh, doing some of the, the first demonstrations of autonomous soaring flight. Uh, since Michael, there's been people at Naval Postgraduate School, right? so Isaac Kaminer and some of his grad students have been doing this. Um, Dan Edwards at Naval Research Lab did some really cool autonomous soaring cross-country flights uh, and competing with his autonomous glider against human RC uh, cross-country glider pilots, uh, and we've been doing some work at, at Penn State as well. So where are we living? Okay, we're living in the atmospheric boundary layer. Um, you can kind of, in this picture, right, the, the height of the atmospheric boundary layer is more or less visible uh, by cloud base, right? So the boundary layer is defined by convection, right? And so the, the atmosphere is well mixed in this layer, uh, and it's all driven by convection, driven by, by solar heating of the ground. Um, and so what's going on here is that you know, sun rises, convection starts to kick off, and the boundary layer starts to get a little bit thick. Okay? And at the top of the boundary layer, that's where you see the, the cumulus clouds. Um, you can usually, or rather not usually, often infer that there's, a, that there's rising air underneath one of these cumulus clouds. Right? You can't always infer that because sometimes the thermal is, is, is dissipated and the cloud is busy disappearing. Okay? Um, so, so you cannot just immediately say there is a thermal under any, every one of these clouds, right? You have to find a cloud that's growing, and then you know that there's a thermal that's living underneath there. And so the trick is to, to kind of find yourself one of these thermals, and then you, you uh, manage the aircraft so it can gain altitude inside the thermal. So we're also flying an SBXC. Um, this is the aircraft we flew. It's awfully messy looking because a couple of months before this flight, we had a fire in the lab, and, and airplanes that weren't destroyed had a lot of soot all over them. And so this is one of the ones that survived. It has a standard off-the-shelf autopilot in it. This particular autopilot was a Piccolo SL, although we've now switched over to Pixhawks because they're easier and cheaper, and you have access to the source code. Um, the, the kind of higher level autonomy stuff all run on, runs on board a computer called an Odroid XU4. An Odroid XU4 is essentially a Samsung Galaxy phone that's been repackaged. It has a serial port. It has uh, some USB. It has an Ethernet port in it as well. Right? And so all the stuff that we run is running on board the airplane on board this, uh, this Odroid XU4. Um, we have an air data sensor, right? so it's a pitot-static system. The little blue circle is where the, the static port lives and the uh, dynamic pressure port is on, on the end of the little stick that's inside the red circle. We have a motor and battery and propeller on board so that we can do takeoff, we do the launch and recovery operations. The other thing that we do with our propeller is, is as we're gliding, if we happen to not find anything, we get low, then we turn the motor on, we climb up uh, a, a few hundred feet, uh, and we turn our motor off and we continue our search pattern. Okay? It, it's fairly important to have a good idea of what your aircraft performance is. And so we spend some time getting flight data to, to measure our aircraft's uh, L over D versus airspeed. What we really care about is the airplane's sink rate versus airspeed, right? So the, the rate of change of altitude with respect to your local air mass uh, as a function of speed. Um, really what you're doing when you do that is trying to figure out what's the power required for level flight because the power required for level flight is your weight multiplied by the, the, the sink rate that the airplane would have if it were a glider. Okay? And so we need that information so we can, we can infer some things about the atmosphere while we're flying. So everything that we do, like I said, lives on board the airplane. There really is four main parts of the platform. Right? There's the airplane itself. Um, there's the autopilot. 
there's the autonomy software, uh, and then there's the ground station. All the autonomy stuff, everything that lives in, or, or is in green, that lives on board this Odor at XU4. The XU4 is running Linux and ROS, robot operating system. We run ROS because we don't want to have to worry about things like messaging and threading and all that stuff, right? So we let ROS take care of that. Um, Inside autonomy, there's a whole bunch of things that are happening. We're computing the energy state of the vehicle and the rates of change of energy state of the vehicle. Uh, we use all those energy states to do things like generate a map of where we find rising air in our world. Um, we use it to help us uh, uh, control the airplane while we're busy trying to gain altitude. We use information to, to help us calculate the uh, optimal speeds to fly, right, to manage flight speeds while we're busy trying to get around. Um, we use our energy maps to, to do destination selection. We use our energy maps to help decide if the airplane needs to continue exploring or if the airplane should actually at this point go and find itself a thermal and gain some altitude because things are getting a little bit, uh, a little bit dicey. Uh, we have an interface with the autopilot. So for this aircraft, like I said, it was the, the Piccolo SL. And as a ground station interface, the ground station really only exists so that we on the ground would know why it was the airplane was going to certain places. Okay? So we could tell what the airplane thought it knew about the environments, and we could tell what the airplane was doing in response to that knowledge. Because otherwise, all you can do is sit on the ground and watch the airplane fly somewhere, right? And knowing why it's doing something at least gives you some, some confidence that you don't have to step in and, and take over control. Um, from the, uh, so takeoff, we did manually. Then we would hand the airplane over to the autopilot do a couple of basic checks, and then we turn on the autonomous soaring system, and from that point on, the airplane is on its own. All we're doing is watching it. Um, and the airplane is busy exploring and, and, and doing its thing. All right, so total energy. And then and, and the question is, you know, well, how do we get total energy? And later we'll see what it is we're doing at total energy. Total energy from the standpoint of an airplane, right, it's, it's uh, airspeed uh, and it's altitude. That, that's what lives in there. And you need to know total energy. Uh, fairly well or really well and then you also need to know its derivatives right so e dot rate of change of total energy and e double dot and the the signal that you get right airspeed for example on on a low cost air data system doesn't come in uh, with with uh, without a whole lot of noise on top so you have to spend quite a bit of, of time kind of filtering stuff um, and then uh, so the kind of the main key here is making sure you get a, a good not highly delayed uh, signal for, for total energy and its derivatives. So why is it important? Uh, we use it for a couple of things. The first one is thermal center and control. Okay? So uh, the kind of famous how to fly a glider book by Reichman says that the way that you center yourself in a thermal is you keep an eye on your, your vertical speed indicator and as you see the vertical speed increase, right, the rate of vertical speed to increase, then you um, uh, level off a little bit, and as you see the, the rate of change of vertical speed starts to decrease, then you roll into the thermal a little bit more. And so uh, you can go and, and implement the exact same thing on a robot glider using E double dot as your feedback signal. Um, and, and Isaac Kaminer and his students proved that this is actually, you know, under, under certain conditions, a stable thermal center and controller. The other thing that we do with, with our total energy, right, is that we use to estimate our wind field, right? So by, by looking at your rate of change of total energy, you can back out what the vertical component of wind speed is going to be. Um, the reason why you want to have your, your E double dot at, you know, high rate without a very large delay uh, is because if you have a delay in your E double dot signal, it starts to look like a phase lag between when you're getting a measurement and when you can actually use the measurement, right? And so that phase lag ends up turning into to, uh, to an instability in trying to manage a thermal center controller, right? So, so even though a thermal center controller based on E double dot is, is theoretically stable and always works, right? It's only that way if you get your E double dot signal at a rate where your phase delay is small. So we use our rate of change of total energy to map energy available in, in the environment. What we're doing here is we take our world, we divide up into a whole bunch of, of grid cells. Each cell is, is about the size of a turn diameter of our glider, right? And in every single cell, we estimate the vertical component of the wind speed. We're, we're essentially running a whole bunch of one-dimensional Coleman filters in here, right? Where each Coleman filter is estimating vertical wind speed and its associated covariance. Um, we're faking out a couple of things here to make the problem uh, easily computationally tractable. We're ignoring the fact that there's correlation between cells, right, in the atmosphere. A thermal is typically a couple hundred meters across, right? Our cells are 50 meters in, in, in diameter, right? So you'd expect that there to be some, some spatial correlation. We're ignoring spatial correlation, at least in the, the, the dynamics of the vehicle. 
Um, we end up using this map of energy availability to help us plan our flight paths, um, and we use it to also to figure out where are we likely to be able to find lift. Um, another spot where a heuristic shows up, right, is in our measurement model in this case, right? So we're ignoring the, the correlation in dynamics from cell to cell, okay? But we are kind of incorporating the fact that, yeah, we know that thermals are a couple hundred meters across, so that means if you detect rising air in the cell that you're in, probably there's rising air in the cells in your immediate neighborhood as well. Okay? And so we take this measurement and we kind of smear it out over the, the, the nearest neighbor cells, allowing that measurement to sort of die out as, as you get farther away from where you are. So we have our wind map, right? What can we do with our wind map? Um, we can calculate the reachability of the airplane. Okay? So how far can the airplane get from its current altitude uh, using information in the wind map? And so we look at the change in total energy for every single cell crossing as we're moving. Okay? Um, and, and this is a kind of not too easy thing to do in closed form. What we end up doing is doing using a particle filter. So we take you know, a thousand or so particles, propagate them uh, across a whole bunch of cells. Right? And because we know something about the, st the statistics of the vertical air motion in each cell, we can do something about the, st the statistics of how the particles will propagate along a path. Okay? Um, and then we get to a point where we define sort of the, the, the distance which 90% of the particles can make it. That's our maximum gliding range for the aircraft from this altitude. And so we do this in a whole bunch of different directions, right? And so we get this thing that looks vaguely like an amoeba. Um, it changes shape as the glider moves, right? It changes shape depending on what, what, what direction the wind is going in. We include terrain in this, okay? Um, it's not entirely the complete farthest distance the glider can go because we're not including the fact that you may be able to fly around a mountain that's in your way, okay? So if there's a mountain in your way, then yeah, you, you don't know that you might be able to fly around it. Okay. Um, well, so the only way to know that it's accurate, right, is to fly something like this over and over and over again and then collect statistics and then, then you'll know. Um, we have flown this, right, and, and, and it, 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 uh, I guess the best that I can really say without having gone through the data and doing all the analysis that it seems to work. Well, that's different from it being accurate. Yeah, exactly. It's not the same as being accurate, right? It seems to work. That's, that's the best. Right now, it's the best I can do. Yeah. So, so the, 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 oh, you mean for the, the atmospheric model? The, so we have a, a kind of our, our atmospheric world, right, this thing. Um, so we were flying in, in an air that's uh, two kilometers by two kilometers, right on a 50 uh, meter cell. You end up with a lot of, of cells that live in there. It, it becomes a really large Coleman filter. Okay? And running a Coleman filter on your cell phone, right, that's that size, doing the matrix inverses starts to become a little bit difficult, right? And it, yeah, well, so remember the purpose that there's a couple of things we use the wind map for. Okay, so let me move on as well. But that's offline, right? No, this is happening in flight. This is happening in real time. In real time, all this is cells. always. That's why we're. That's why we're making that. Uh, that all the cells. Yeah. So in our. So yes. Okay. But we are. The answer to John's question could be. Could be if you tested it and it works, and it is accurate. Uh, well, the answer could be that it is accurate, but I don't know that the answer is that it's accurate. There, those are two doing two different things. Okay? The Coleman filter is... Because I don't need... To, I, so the, the dynamics of the wind model that I'm using here is linear, okay? and the measurement model that I have is linear. Well, I'm measuring wind speed, right, and I'm trying to estimate wind speed, right? So that's, that's noise on top of the measurement. Or at least the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm treating that. It gets treated as noise on top of the measurement. Okay, you can think of it as being process noise. We're, we're using process noise, so it's slightly different. But. Okay, so, so we can figure out how far we can get in our wind field. That's one of the things that we do with our wind field. The other thing that we do with our wind field is we figure out what's the likelihood that I can find a useful thermal in a particular cell. OK? 
okay? Uh, and so that's, we end up using that for, for, for path planning. We do that for a couple of things, right? First thing we use that for is for decision making, okay? So uh, if we have several spots that are likely to be good thermals that are still within our, our glide range, okay, then, then we feel fairly safe, okay? Once, once we, we're down to one, maybe two likely places where we can find lift in our glide amoeba, then we start to get a little bit nervous, okay? And we, we either say to ourselves, we have to go find our thermal now, okay? Uh, or we say to ourselves, hey, I've, I'm, I've got plenty of altitude. The likelihood is that that'll be okay. Uh, so you do the maneuver. Sorry, me? So you do the Bryzo maneuver. The Bryzo maneuver, which is? Uh, but you, you, you can't gain total energy from that. No, but you can gain height. And it is actually used by fighter pilots. Fighter pods have fighter pods have a jet engine on board that they can use. Okay, so so if I have a glider and I'm not running a motor and I start here, it is uh, impossible for me to get right to to here with the same velocity that I was when I was here. Right, you necessarily have less total energy at the end of this process. My understanding yeah. of the Bryson maneuver is that you transition through the speed of sound, the sound barrier, no, it's so that you gain. Yeah, but that, that, inv that involves thrust from a, that involves thrust from a jet, and we, we were not using thrust here. I heard okay. the about it. Yeah, but at the end of it, you don't. You have not gained total energy at the end of it, right? So we're trying to gain total energy in this whole process. Okay, so, so we've got a bunch of things that we're trying to do to manage this whole process, right? We can explore, we can exploit lift, we can search for lift. And, and Actually, I'll take that back. If I have winds and if I'm a bird, I can gain energy from the way I, I, I direct my wind from the leaf. Only if you have uh, wind shear. If you have wind shear, yes, you can, okay, right? Yeah. Or if there's vertical air motion, which is exactly what we're doing here. I, I, I figure that's what the birds, the birds are doing. They dive, and at the same time, they orient their wind then they're exploiting wind shear if they're doing that right. and, and RC, air, RC pilots do, do, do dynamic soaring like that as well and, and back to your theme, I don't have to have a jet, I can actually do it by taking the energy from the environment then you have to know that the energy is there yes. yeah. Yes. Only local. yeah, that's right so, uh, again, so we're, we're, we're trying to do kind of somewhat longer range planning with this Okay, so so uh, the way that we kind of manage the flight vehicle here is is with a, a finite state machine, right? It's deciding when to do its transitions. Um, we use our map to figure out what's the utility of a thermal somewhere far away in the map, right? So the utility of a thermal that's far away in the map is is the energy you can expect to gain from the thermal, right? And you have to subtract from that the energy it's going to cost you to get there. You don't need a time automaton. You're fine just by knowing next time and not knowing precisely when you're timing. Yeah, so far this has been fine for us. So far. Because you know what I mean? I mean, the difference between a final state machine and time automaton is I also, I now have explicit time. Yeah, time. yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so we're, we're, we're not doing that. We're, we're just kind of making decisions. And, and we, we check our finite state machine at something like once a minute or so. Who gives time? Uh, the, the Odroid. You know, with the, uh, so, so Ross, is, it's not really a hard time, hard real time system, okay? But it's hard, it's real time enough for what we're doing here. Uh, yeah, so we're like we're not doing dynamic soaring maneuvers here. <coughs> not so, not really, right? So we tell the autopilot speeds to fly, and we, we update speeds to fly about once once a second or so. Okay. Um, Okay, so we do speed to fly calculations. Uh, this, this is, so when do you bother taking a thermal? Right? So suppose I'm flying to a thermal somewhere, right, and I encounter something along the way. And the question is, do I take this one that I just found, or do, do I take the one that's farther away? Okay? Um, and, and we check that by looking at that, that term, the equivalent climb rate of a thermal. Is a thermal that I've just found, right, is its, its net climb rate better than what I would get to uh, for something that's far away? Right? And so we, we make that decision in real time as we encounter thermals as well. It is buried inside the speed to fly. Because this is, you know, I mean, the whole idea is, you know, when I have this curve, the horizontal matter because it gives me the lead. Yeah, so the reason why uh, speed to fly shows up in here, so we're here calculating the speed to fly, right, that uh, maximizes the distance traveled across the ground mm -hmm. compared with the altitude that you lose. Okay? So uh, you think of it, and, and so this simplifies down to flying at best all over D if there is zero wind. Okay? And, Zero and zero wind, this simplifies down to flying at best delivery D. Okay. 
Okay? Uh, what the kind of practically speaking, what this tells you is that if you're flying into a headwind, you fly a little bit faster. If you fly with a tailwind, you can fly a little bit slower. If you're flying in upwards moving air, you fly a little bit slower. And if you're in downwards moving air, you fly a little bit faster. Right? So this is all stuff that glider pilots have known since 1946 or so when Paul McCready invented the speed to fly ring. Okay? And so we implemented this on our, on our glider. The, uh, this doesn't, okay? We're not doing any dynamic soaring here. This is all static soaring. Okay, so how do we decide where to explore? Okay, so we, we base exploration on, on uh, kind of terrain and solar related things, and we also base exploration on, on uh, uh, how or what the covariance of our wind map is, right? So, so thermals tend to dissipate over about 10, 15 minutes or so. Buried in the dynamic model of our thermals is a, a covariance term that, that, that uh, reduces the, the uh, certainty in our thermal estimate over time. So we go and look at places where we haven't been in a long time. Okay? That's, that's one of the things we think about. The other thing that we think about is uh, solar incidence on terrain, because that tends to, you know, uh, 90 degree solar incidence on terrain will tend to cause terrain to heat up more quickly. So you're more likely to get a thermal kicking off there. Um, there is anecdotal evidence, maybe a bit more than anecdotal evidence, that suggests that thermals tend to kick off on spots where the wind is blowing uh, transverse to upslopes. Okay? Um, and so we look for spots where the wind is blowing either against a tree line or where the wind is blowing uphill. And we'll look for spots that. Um, and then we will also look for spots where the terrain has, has a larger sensible heat flux, right? So for example, a parking lot has a lot of heat flux because it's black, um, and so it tends to get really hot. Swamps in the morning tend to be a bad place to look for thermals because the water's still cold. Although late in the day, by the time they've warmed up, right, then swamps turn out to be a fairly good place to go look for thermals. And okay? so those things are buried in our exploration priority. Do you have a stored land map in, in your... Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, and so that comes from USGS. Uh, and and the, the terrain cover, the land cover, also comes from USGS. That's how the Wright brothers decide on key costs. So um, you don't have vision, though. Correct. We do not have vision. <sighs> that one is hard to answer for sure, right? So for humans, it's tremendously helpful. Okay. And the reason why it's helpful for us is, is because you know you 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 take your glider lessons, and your flight instructor says, hey, okay, that over there is a cumulus cloud. Take a close look at it, see what it does, and you can see it grow. Okay, there's a thermal under there. Go to it. That one over there, it's shrinking. No thermal there. Don't go there. Um, to get a computer vision system to recognize one cumulus clouds, right, and not cirrus clouds, I think would be rather difficult. Uh, getting the computer to recognize a cumulus cloud that's growing and not dissipating is rather difficult. Um, if you're in Arizona and it's a really dry day, there are no cumulus clouds, right? You get blue thermals all over the place, so that, that kind of causes problems. People have tried to do things like uh, use infrared cameras looking at the ground and look for hot spots on the ground, uh, but I've yet to see anything that suggests that this actually works. Right? Yeah, you, look. That's right, and so there, there's, yeah, there's been a, so, so you know, uh, uh, RC pilots that have really good eyes, they can see things like, you know, clouds of insects getting sucked up into a thermal, for example. Or you see, like, like corn, what right? Do you see yeah, well, that's, that's another thing that's funny, so I'll mention that later. Um, so, but yeah, insects, right, they get sucked up into thermals. If your eyes are really good, you can see that, right? Dust, you can see that. There's been a couple of cases early in the morning, right, where you kind of get that low ground fog, right? And you can see pillars of ground fog rising up from spots. Uh, if you can see all these things with a computer vision system, then yes, it'd be awesome. Um, Do you know about DNS cameras? The which? DNS cameras. No. OK. Yeah. There are very small cameras now, but they are particularly uh, designed to, to, to give you only the stuff when you move. OK. Yeah. Like, uh, we use them here for the pilots and for flying whenever they want to do it. OK. Uh, they are all inspired by these and there. No yeah, way. so the optical flow type yeah, system? Exactly. Yeah, so OK. They're very simple. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. OK. Relating to this optical solution, um, is there a way to sense light diffraction through different velocities? And yeah, and so that's one of these other If you can see it, right, then it's great. Um, the, uh, there's kind of been talk about, okay, let's use, let's use a, a forward-looking light, like a light or a laser Doppler anemometer, for instance, right? Uh, the problem with using, using a Doppler anemometer is that you only get a component of the wind field in the direction of your laser beam. Right? And so you'd have to be pointing it down to get a vertical component. Um, 
and then you're pointing it down and you don't get the forward look that you're looking for anymore, right? So that kind of makes things tricky. So being stuck with the fact that you can only detect a thermal when you blunder into it, right, makes this uh, a, a difficult problem. And that's actually what makes the mapping helpful because you can go back to where you've been before. More importantly, or more helpfully, right, you can share information with five or six other gliders in a flock. Right? And we have some sim results from several years ago that suggest that as soon as you have about six gliders in a flock, then you can stay up indefinitely because you, you, you are visiting places often enough that you have accurate knowledge of, of what the world is. Um, that's something we still have to flight test. So we flight tested two vehicles sharing information, but, but not more than two. So we were flying at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, so you all know where that is. It's not far from here. Um, this is Aberdeen Proving Ground from the tail of our airplane. Um, we were there twice, once in September and once in late October. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any tail cam footage from the September flights because we'd been told that uh, every single picture has to get cleared by Aberdeen Proving Ground staff, and I thought, I don't want to have to deal with that problem, not realizing that that's not my problem. Okay? That's their problem, to clear all that stuff. And so I, didn't, did, I don't have, have uh, video data from, from, uh, from the first flight. The reason why I wish I had video data is because there's a lot of bird activity at Aberdeen. Um, vultures, hawks, lots of bald eagles. Um, this is a case where we had, and this happened over and over again over the course of several days. Uh, this is a, a somewhat immature bald eagle. Um, and I know he's immature because of the pattern of feathers on, on his wings. Okay? Um, and we were in a thermal circling, and this bald eagle was coming down on us like this, right, continuously. Uh, and, and it never put its claws into us, which I know because there are no claw marks, and we never crashed, okay, because that would have taken us out for sure. Um, but it was definitely very curious about what it is that we were, and probably also wondering why, why weren't we doing such a good job thermaling, okay? Because um, they're pretty good at it, bald eagles. Uh, yeah, well, that was the other thought, right? It, it is an immature bald eagle, right? <laughs> Um, so on for, I don't have tail camera video of, of, of this guy because we didn't have the tail camera on at the time. Um, so uh, the other thing that's interesting is, uh, so you know, vultures have a lot lower wing loading than bald eagles do. When we were there in September, we had just had a, a massive cold front that swept through the, the weekend before. Um, and uh, we were like really nice, solid, post-frontal thermal soaring conditions. It wasn't very windy. Okay, uh, early in the morning, the vultures would be popping up, and then later in the day, as, as, as the thermals got really strong, then the bald eagles would be up all over the place. Uh, vultures would fly quite a bit slower than this airplane was flying. Uh, we were flying at six and a half kilograms. Uh, we have a one square meter wingspan. Wing loading is pretty close to bald eagle wing loading. Uh, we have a smaller airplane now that's got a vulture-sized wing loading, and so we're going to be trying to do some more vulture-like flight techniques. Um, every time our glider happened to be in a thermal, it would get joined almost immediately by other airplanes, or by, by some of the birds that were around. Um, a, a way to tease thermal soaring birds is to turn the motor on and to fly in a circle at constant altitude, okay? uh, because that's a way to attract the local bird life as well. So this is our mission area. This is at the, at the bottom end of Phillips Army Airfield. Uh, the little inset shows land cover. Right? Uh, the, the, the red is pavements. Uh, the blue is kind of semi sort of scrub. Uh, there's some dark blue there that's a bit swampy, uh, and the green is mostly trees. So we have a fair bit of difference in ground cover. Um, terrain here was really, really quite flat, right? So I can't make any comments at all about the effect of wind and terrain on where thermals are kicking off, really only about what ground cover was doing. And so this is one of our typical flight operations. We take off uh, under full manual control. Um, we climb up to, to a couple hundred feet altitude. We hand control over to the Piccolo autopilot. The Piccolo does a couple of little basic checks. We're flying around in circles over our launch site while we check things out. Then we hand control over to the autonomous system. That's when the thing turns into blue. Okay? Uh, and then when it's autonomous, the motor is shut down, and it's busy exploring and trying to find thermals. Um, while we fly, right, you're kind of, unless you're in a thermal, you're losing altitude. The, our system is set up so that if we get to a, to a floor, right, which for us was something like 140 feet above ground level, we turn the motor on, we climb at full throttle back up to 350 feet or so, and we shut the motor back down. Uh, that is not the optimal way to manage a system like this, okay, but it is really, really easy to quickly implement, right? And it also means that, that you're really clear between when you're thermal soaring or exploring and when you're actually running the motor to... to this is an electric motor, yeah. 
Exactly. That's right. Yeah, you, you could put photovoltaic system on the wing, and then, and then that's it. You're, you're all set. Yeah. Um, there's one case here where the motor turns on during the flight uh, here at, at about 4,500 seconds. Uh, we flew right over the antenna null of our ground station, and the system is set up so that if you have a communications dropout, the motor turns on, it motors its way over to a spot where you know that you're out of the antenna null, and then it, it, it handed control back over to the autonomous soaring system in that case. We never interfered with the whole thing, right? The autopilot took over, got us to a point where we had communications link again, and then the autonomous system took over again. Uh, we had a climb here. We didn't quite make it up to a mile high ever during the week that we were here. Uh, 1,600 meters, we 1,500 and change meters above ground. I think our longest climb that we ever did was 1,000 meters or so worth of climb in one of our thermals. Every spot here where you can see it's green, that's where he's climbing, where he's latched and climbing in a thermal, and all the red is where, the, where he's busy exploring. This is our longest flight, uh, two hours and about 40 minutes or so. Um, there's one spot here where we have to turn the motor on uh, at about 5,000 seconds. Air traffic control got on the horn and said we have incoming traffic. You either bring your airplane down right now or you get yourself up to 3,000 feet so you're out of our way. We turn on the motor, got it up to 3,000 feet, uh, and then turn the soaring system back on again. Um, and, and, and so here you can see you know, when we run the motor, you can see motor battery getting drained. Avionics battery gets drained roughly at constant rates. Right? And then the line that just looks like a straight line, but that's because it's zoomed out too far, right? That's how much energy we're losing to drag while we're busy flying along. Um, so climb has a couple of different modes in it. There's the mode where we're kind of, we, we've hit a thermal, we think we want to take it. We do a couple of circles to explore to try and find where the center of the thermal lives. Um, then we run our, our thermal center and controller. We also have something in here that says, okay, you know, uh, what should our turn radius be to maximize our rate of, of climb inside the thermal, right? Uh, the tighter you bank the airplane, right, the, the larger lift coefficient you have to fly at, the higher sink rate gets. Um, but if you have a nice tight circle, then you're probably in the core of the thermal where the vertical air component or vertical wind component is really high, right? So you're playing that game between finding the, the kind of net maximum climb rate, and we do that by allowing the, the turn radius to vary, right? We're essentially running a extremum seeking controller using turn radius as the, uh, as the controlled variable. Okay, in this particular case, we had a climb of almost 1,200 meters in, in total as uh, while well we got our climb in. So uh, this shows 14 minutes worth of flights, and it shows the evolution of our wind map and of our lift probability map over time, right? And so um, satura I don't see saturation. Normally, we kind of keep track of, of our certainty in the wind map with saturation, right? So the, the more saturated a color is, the, the more certain we are that the wind there is correct. Um, as we fly around, you can see spots where we've got clear vertical air motion, right? There's a spot at, at the, the last picture, 3,365 seconds, right? There's a little kind of core of red in there. The glider has found a really good thermal, and it's in the thermal, continuously collecting measurements in that thermal. Uh, the lift probability map is the likelihood that you're going to find a thermal with a climb rate greater than I think, one meter per second or so was our cutoff, right? Um, and so the glider is busy circling and something has a climb rate greater than one meter per second, and so you're absolutely certain you've got exactly one meter per second climb rate in there. So the spots where it is explored recently enough to have useful information are all the spots up here where there's color that's not pale green, okay? Um, because it hasn't been to those places in a while. That's why. But it's an airplane. It can't leave. Well, so... It can't skip a well, it's flying around. It happened to fly around that region and not through that region. Yeah, I was thinking further down on the left. Uh, down like so this. That same, that same picture, but, but you've got that little... Rectangle blue. Yeah, there. yeah, like in there. It, it must have just kind of circled some around here and then skipped right through that little bit to get through. So part of it is kind of, so remember it, the, this scale is something like four kilometers and every pixel inside here is 50 meters across. And so there's kind of pixelation information lost visually, right? That's this happening inside here. So you're not, it, it hasn't, there is a little connection that's inside there. Yeah, that's fine. This one here, we got... Well, further to the left, there's that little isolated rectangle. That's right there? there the whole or time. this one right there? Just below your finger. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know what is going on over there. It's also possible that it had explored over here, right, and just detected that that winds over here, vertical wind point here is zero, right? And here it found a patch of sink. I'm sure there's some judgment about how much data you keep. 
Yeah, there is. And so, so yeah, and then we leave. And so that's the other thing that happens, right, is, and so the, we'll get to the, the next thing. We do keep track kind of cumulatively of where are we likely to find lift over the days, right? Um, and so it turns out there are spots where you tend to find lift over and over and over again. It does vary with time of day, okay? So you're, you're very likely to find lift in the mornings here over the runways. And late in the day, it's all kind of swampy here, very likely to find lift over here. Um, and so we keep track of that as well. And so by the time we got to the last day of our flying day, right, we launched the glider. And sure enough, the first thing the thing does, it goes and starts exploring up here because it knows that a lot of the time it's found stuff over there. And, and human glider pods know this as well, right? That there are house thermals that exist near glider ports and, and you kind of decide to go there. So uh, is the map useful? Is the map correct, right? Uh, those are things that, that we don't exactly know, right? We think the map is, is, is useful and correct because it, it seems to work for us, right? Uh, we, we most definitely stay aloft longer while we're busy mapping lift. Um, we uh, use the map, right, if, if you're flying along, you get low, you decide, okay, it's time for me to go to map lift, right, we, we often find lift in a spot where we had mapped it before, right? uh, and so, so that's kind of a measure of, of, of success for us. Another way that we kind of measure utility of the map, right, is um, how, if, if, if you uh, have lift mapped in your, in your world, right, how long did you generally fly before you run into something, right? And so the reason why that's kind of useful, right, if you have mapped lift, you're likely to decide to fly towards something that's been mapped, right, and you use it, right, so your, your distance between climbs becomes a smaller number. If you've got nothing, you're just kind of flying around randomly, right, th then it's, you're, you're more likely to, to spend a while flying before you run into anything. So it's, it's a very kind of a fuzzy way of, of, of hand wavy way of, of saying whether or not this, the, the map is useful or not, right? The kind of the utility shows up, well, you know, the airplane flies for a long time while we have the map on board. Um, so here I've got a, kind of a, a sort of point map that shows where you tend to find lift at what time of day uh, in, the, in the upper right-hand corner, right? And so, so spots over runways early in the day, we often find lift, right? Uh, over the swamp late in the day, we often find lift there. Um, I was also trying to keep track of, of is there a relationship between time of day, right, and, and how long a climb is likely to be. Um, kind of our longest climb uh, started out, you know, fairly late in the kind of mid-afternoon, right, that's when, when the boundary layer has kind of reached its full depth, right, you're most likely kind of from an from a sort of atmospheric standpoint to have your longest climb, so that's not really that much of a surprise. Um, Early in the day, climbs tend to start from a low altitude and end at a low altitude just because the boundary layer is still really thin. In this, does the wind velocity, the overall wind velocity matter? You mean the, the horizontal yeah. component of wind? The Wright brothers like to fly in the late afternoon because the wind is steadier and weaker. Yeah. Um, so the right, at Kitty Hawk at least, right, the Wright brothers would have been flying into the onshore breezes. Yeah, this, is, this is even in Paris. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't know enough about kind of what winds are like in Paris, right, to know. Uh, at Aberdeen, the week that we were there. And, and, and at uh, Fort Myers in Virginia. Okay. Yeah, the, the week that we were in Aberdeen, though, the winds were fairly constant over the course of the, like, really early in the morning, yeah, there's nothing, right? There's, there's no wind. Um, uh, and then over the, the kind of strongest wind that we saw while we were there was eight or so miles per hour, right? So it's not a whole lot of wind when you get right down to it. The horizontal winds, in this case, no, right? We're doing... But again, do you have any connection to pilots from aircraft carriers or stuff like that? I mean, you tell the entire aircraft carrier so that you are against the wind so that you take off easier. Yeah, but that's... You completely neglect it. I mean, come on. But we're not taking off and landing here, right? Every I mean, single... It's not just for the wind, it's just for taking more heat. The same pressure we had before. No, the difference... Yeah. The reason why you take off into the wind is so that your ground speed is lower compared with your airspeed. No, that's a different thing. I would strongly advise you, next time you go near the sea, watch the, the birds, okay? <laughs> and you see what they do. Yeah, and they're so... There you will have strong wind, and you see they go like this and go up. Yeah, and the reason... What they're doing... So here is our ground. Or C, okay, it doesn't matter. I like everything you've done. The only suggestion I make is that the, the horizontal wind cannot be ignored. It's helpful. So what albatrosses, right, uh, and, and seagulls do it a little bit, right? But what they're doing is this. Yeah. 
Okay? And what you're doing is as you gain altitude, right, you're, you're flying into a region with a large, so you're exploiting here the gradients of the wind field. And you can gain energy from the gradient of the wind field. Right? Uh, in fact, Lanchester talks about this in, in aerodynamics. And I think we're not doing gradient-based soaring here. Okay? This is all static soaring. How difficult is to uh, So the, the, the difficulty, the parts of the machinery exist. Okay? Parts. Um, the, the difficulty is at high altitude, you, the only time you find wind shear at altitude, right, is, is if there happens to be a uh, temperature inversion, right? So Ingle Renner, there, there are stories of a glider plane named Ingle Renner in Australia going and doing dynamic soaring across a shear layer, okay? Um, so this is kind of anecdotal written about in, in Soaring Magazine. The, the uh, RC pilots who do dynamic soaring, they go to a, to a mountain, right? Wind is blowing this way, and then you've got wind up here and not a whole lot happening down here, right? And so they're flying through here. Every time you cross the shear layer, right, you gain airspeed of, of delta wind, right? But here's why I'm, I'm asking you this. <laughs> My objective is to stay up there as much as possible yeah. and explore as well the area as possible. I'm not so much scared to be so high. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have enough energy and flying to stay up there. And yeah, yeah. So, so why not go do dynamic soaring at low altitude? Point number one, point number two, detecting the, the direction of the wind is very easy. Yes, exactly. And we keep track of that as well because we use it for our glide and even all that stuff. So the, the, the kind of other things that are hard about dynamic soaring, right? One is, is the, the, the time you gain the most energy is where the wind shear is the greatest. That's down here. Okay, so you've got to be really careful not to crash. Um, albatrosses are really good at it because they can see and everything. Okay? Um, and uh, so th that's kind of the, the, the main thing that's hard about it, right? is, is not crashing while you're down here. Um, the other thing is, right, al it, you, it takes a fair bit of wind to make dynamic soaring work, right? So albatross, it looks like they need about 10 meters per second or so of, of, of mean wind speed up, up at altitude for, for them to have enough wind shear to make it work. So a 20 mile an hour wind, that's getting up there, right? And, and certainly for a vehicle with a wing loading similar to a vulture, right, you, 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 don't, you don't often see vultures flying around in 20 meter per second winds or 10 meter per second winds. So. Okay, so this is us at... Uh, Yeah, there's some things they do to that are really interesting. So this is us at pretty high altitude, right? There's our friend, uh, the, the young bald eagle behind us again. Um, just so you don't go... Th I don't know. When they're, when they're this big, they all look the same to me. Um, things don't always go so well. Um, uh, uh, that, that's kind of a clue that, that you have to be very careful where you put your tow hook when you're bungee launching an airplane. Um, but... You know, you breathe epoxy fumes for an hour in the hotel room uh, later, and then, and then things are okay again, and you're flying again the next day. Um, the, the, yeah, uh, I had the bigger hotel room, so I had the airplane next to my bed emitting fumes while I was trying to sleep. Um, this is uh, a later week. Um, as it turned out, right, does everyone remember when the, uh, the, that uh, J-Lens uh, blimp released and, and went kind of floating northwards, right? That, that happened to be this particular week. Um, uh, so we were at, at Aberdeen Proving Ground, and one of these airplanes is, this is us, and that's Naval Research Lab's aloft airplane. Um, and so we were sending them wind field data, all right, and then they could go and, and find a thermal where we had mapped one before. All right, I'm going to show you a video, because I think I have time to show a video, and the video is cool. Well, the only other question I have is, why you have pissing in your title? Because I haven't seen anything about pissing yet. Ah, uh, well. All right, so this is tail video. Um, from our airplane, this is the uh, second week. Uh, so in October, we were up there. Um, and right now, the airplane is busy exploring. It thinks it's found a thermal. It has dropped its flaps by 7 degrees, right, which is what the, the manual for the SBXC says you're supposed to do when you're thermaling this airplane. And one of the things we did not do was go and try to collect a lot of data with the flaps at different settings to know what really the, the, the best thermal flap setting is. So it's found a thermal. Um, it's busy, like, centering it, trying to, 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 to lock into it nicely. So far, it's, it's all pretty happy. And we're off the nose of the airplane now, that, that little loop you can see at the end of the runway. There's a little white dot, that's our tent. 
we're not super high at this point. And now things go south. And our human test pilot takes over, we're trying to recover the airplane. And he spends quite a bit of time trying to get the airplane to fly stably right side up. And it's awfully difficult. Um, and the reason why it's difficult is because we've lost elevator control at this point, right? So we have no elevator here. And it turns out the airplane is stable inverted. Okay? And in a minute, we figure this out. <laughs> okay? And now we're inverted in a steady glide, right? <laughs> we, we have no glide path control in this case, but we do have heading control. Uh, because we still have a rudder and we still have ailerons. We, one more try, can we make this work? Answer is no. Okay. We go inverted. And now we're busy trying to set up a nice stable approach, right? Downwind, crosswind, right? You know, downwind leg, base leg, and, and, and final approach. Uh, you can see where we're trying to go in the upper right hand corner of the screen there. We're all sitting there looking very nervously. <laughs> um, but our pilot, John, is pretty solid. And he's got a nice, steady, uh, you know, downwind leg set up here. So the upside down? Uh, well, so so the interesting thing, right? In in those thirty seconds or so at the beginning of the flight, or at the beginning of this whole process, right? That's when he kind of learned, okay, there is an island of stability upside down for this airplane, um, given its current configuration. And so now we're turning on to final. In a second, you'll see the shadow of the airplane on the ground. All right, and uh, next day we flew again. <laughs> uh, well, another hour or two. Yeah. Yeah. So not that much broke, luckily, right? So so there is a bit of a crack that showed up in the in the uh, the fuselage right where the 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 tail sticks up, but. Really, there's not a whole lot that, that broke in this. We, we've had other crashes that were worse, put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the tail really didn't have much damage on it. Um, so so the, uh, it turned out that what had happened at some points, right, for some earlier repair we made on the airplane, uh, some CA had dripped down onto the control horn of the servo that runs the elevator. And it locked up the little Dubro quick joint that we had on there, right, which would normally allow things to, to rotate while the servo moves. And so it wasn't. It was just doing this. And eventually, the little bit of metal that was there broke, and we no longer had a connection. We had a now free-floating elevator. Um, so we replaced that little thing, uh, fly again. I think this was Wednesday or something. We flew again Thursday. Uh, Friday, last day of the week, we are flying again, and the exact same thing happened in the exact same spot in the sky as well. Um, and uh, again, we've completely lost servo control. Uh, and that time, the airplane crashed. We broke the wings. Uh, couldn't, we were a bit lower, I think. And we couldn't make it home all the time. We crashed into a tree. Uh, and so we went afterwards and checked every single servo. And, and the servo that ran the elevator was dead. And of course, we had neglected to replace the servo after we had that first failure. So uh, if anything breaks in your airplane, just replace everything. That's the, the, the short version of the story. All right, questions? Vultures have dihedral, and that works better, I understand, at low speeds. Do you have any explanation for why and what that does. Yeah, and so, I mean, you know, the Wright brothers actually mentioned specifically the dihedral of various birds, right? And, 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 and Langley had a dihedral yeah. wing. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, a lot of radio-controlled sailplanes will have a dihedral wing. So, so the dihedral gives you a lot of roll stability, okay? Um, and and it, depending on what you're trying to do, right, too much roll stability is a bad idea, okay? Um, vultures, I'm not sure why vultures want to have so much roll uh, stability. Uh, I had a grad student check, hey, what happens if you have a lot of dihedral, because pigeons fly with a ton of dihedral too, right? So I had my grad student say, what happens if you get a side gust with dihedral? Do you get any kind of thrust component out of it? Um, and the answer to that was, well, maybe, but not enough. And it's the other wing that, that 
that it hoses you, right? So they're not flying with dihedral because it gives them any kind of thrust from side gusts. One of the things about motors that make the explanation is they can't see straight ahead, so they have to tilt to see the ground. Mm -hmm. So that would, that would mean that they want to fly, you know, at an angle. Yeah. Um, and, and again, the, the way that vultures fly seems to be completely different from the way that, that, that eagles seem to fly, right? Vultures, they're in no hurry to get anywhere, right? <laughs> they're just kind of doing this the whole time, right? Um, and and, and there, if, if you look at, uh, say, large eddy simulations of atmosphere, for example, right? Uh, there, there's pretty solid evidence, at least if you believe the LES simulations, that at really low altitude, there's just kind of sort of I don't know what the, what the right word is. I mean, really he fuzzy hand wave, but kind of little tendrils of, of rising air that eventually, when you get to a bit higher altitude, they kind of coalesce and form a thermal, right? And it looks to me like these vultures are busy flying along in these little streamers of rising air. Um, there's a guy named Gary Asoba who does microlift soaring, right? And, and he does this as well. So he's flying at really low speeds, really low altitudes, um, and, 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 and trying to track these little streamers of, of, of air, right, as, as they kind of try to, to converge into a thermal. So I, I, my suspicion is that vultures are trying to do this as well. Uh, I've never seen an eagle do anything quite like that. I have seen a hawk before take off on a pretty windy day, right, and the hawk is working really hard in, in mechanical turbulence off a tree line, okay, slowly gaining altitude, and then it found a thermal, starts circling, and is gone. Okay. Um, and, and days, uh, so the, the second week that we, that we were at Aberdeen, the, the weather wasn't quite as nice. It was pretty crummy, actually, most days. Um, there was just enough lift for us to be able to find thermals and fly. It was pretty windy, uh, and there were no vultures flying on any of those days. Plenty of bald eagles kicking around, but no vultures. Um, now, it was late October. Maybe they'd all decide to fly south for the winter or something, okay? But... I seem to see vultures at State College throughout the whole winter as well, so I'm not sure they would have flown that far south yeah. from there anyway, right? Plenty of things die in the winter. Yeah, so, so I think they just decided not to fly on those couple of days because it was just too windy to be pleasant for them. So. Yeah, it was my suspicion too. It's just, just for stability to, to kind of make it easy to fly. They don't have to worry about, about kind of like careful flight control. Yeah, so, um, and then... Yeah, so it's, it's not too good to be too stable, right? Because if you're flying in gusts, you get bounced around too much, right? Well, if you're like this and you get a side gust, you bounce, right? You, you get bounced more. Yeah, you won't, you won't, you won't flip, yeah. But stability is much more of a problem for a, a hunter than it is for a scavenger. Because the uh, vulture knows perfectly well that what it wants to eat isn't going to go anywhere. Yeah. It, Whereas the eagle, if it sees something, it better be able to, you know, hop after it. And, and that's... And it, that's being not so stable as a help. Yeah. They go like a bullet. When they die, you see them? Oh, yeah. They, 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 they put their wings on, they go like a bullet again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or like so a falcon on the, on the yeah. suit. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, what's the future? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good question. Oh, me? Oh, my future. Yeah, what, no, no, your future. How much? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you going to add to all the others? Yeah, that's that's the um, so. Or other things you may want to think. Yeah, so uh, dynamic soaring is one of those things that I think is super cool. Um, so so I've said that right. So you're expecting a butt, right? And there is a butt. Um, whether or not it's really useful from a kind of an operational UAV standpoint, mm, I'm a bit uh, hesitant. On that score. It's a really great way to learn an awful lot about flight dynamics okay? um, and, and, and flight control because you have to be pretty good at flight control to make dynamic soaring work. Um, trajectory planning is, is also non-trivial right, for dynamic soaring. Um, so, so it's a great way to learn a lot about flight control and about flight dynamics. Like, so whether or not it's going to be operationally useful, I'm a, a bit skeptical. Um, I have a much easier time convincing myself right, that, that uh, Static soaring, right? thermal soaring, or soaring in, in ridge lift or wave is, is going to be kind of operationally useful for something. Um, so I, I, I kind of like that better. It's also, it's, it's kind of from a, yeah, it's easier to gain energy from static soaring than it is to gain energy from dynamic soaring. It, it takes kind of less, less effort, essentially, to, to do that. 
Um, part of it is just because of time scales of things, right? You can treat the glider as, as a kinematic vehicle, essentially, right, when you're doing dynamic, or when you're doing static soaring. If you're doing dynamic soaring, now all of a sudden you've got to worry about all the higher order dynamics in the vehicle. So, um, doing things like, you know, sharing information between vehicles in a flock, right? That's kind of the, the, the sort of obvious way to go in this point. And there's been some people, some flight demos of this, Right, but, but nothing that I've seen published in any kind of a extensive sort of a way yet. Um, do you, do you think we probably, probably want to put a camera on it anyway, you know, for the sake of getting more information to the people who are paying you to soar? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So once you've got the camera on it... Yeah, you may as well try to use it for something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so the, the one way that would be really cool, and, and, and I finally saw something that suggests to me that it might actually be feasible to do so, is, um, so yeah, looking for other birds that are out there, right? So if you can find birds, right? And, and so I just saw one of the things that uh, A-Cubed is doing with their Fahana airplane, right, is they want to be able to, to see other traffic out there. And so they've just done a demo using a, a fairly kind of a, a standard camera, not a special camera, but in real time they can detect birds or even stuff that, that you, know, you as a human are looking at the screen going, is that a speck on my computer monitor or is that a bird in the image, right? And they're, they're pulling birds out of it. So that is some, that something that says, okay, maybe it's now kind of technically feasible to start pulling bird information out of the, uh, the image stream. Because um, you don't get a whole lot of pixels on a bird, right? Because they're, they're not very big and they're pretty far away, typically. Yeah, so this stuff I just talked about, there's two papers in the Journal of Field Robotics. They're both online right now. Um, uh, Autosore, look for Autosore Journal of Field Robotics, and you should be able to find it. Like I said, they're, they're both online. Um, I made the big mistake, don't ever do this, of, of writing the two papers as uh, part one, theory and algorithms, part two, hardware implementation and flight demo. Okay? Don't ever do that. It takes, reviewers hate it. And it takes a, you know, a year and a half to get the papers through review. So don't ever write papers that way. 